So I think we can get going. Welcome back from the break. Thank you, Iris, again for sponsoring the break. Uh, this session here will be uh, around the big data topic. There's another breakout session for the buy side in the adjacent room. I'm pleased to invite Andre Craig to the stage to introduce and moderate the next discussion. Andre is Vice President of DMX Data Links and is responsible for the Data Links product and business development activities. His primary role is managing the growth and diversification of market data and delivery solutions initiatives. He is also responsible for overseeing the TMX Atrium business. During his time at TMX, Andre has served in both the trading and market data businesses. And prior to joining TMX, Andre worked for several Canadian banks where he worked in various management positions, including investment product management, international banking, and operations. Andre? Thank you very much. All lies, I assure you. I'd um, like to welcome the panelists uh, up to the stage. Uh, we have Adam Diamet, who's a quantitative consultant with Stream-Based Systems. Sean uh, Henniger, who's uh, Capital Markets Practice Lead with SWI. Adam Muse, who's a solution uh, engineer with Hortonworks. Bill Ruvo, America's business manager, Thomson Reuters Electron. And we have Chris Reimer, uh, who's with Composite Software. Welcome, gentlemen. So big data. Uh, I was asked to, uh, to moderate this panel, and um, it's a very nebulous thing. So what is it, and uh, why do we care? Uh, recently, I'm sure you've all seen on the news uh, the issues around national security and uh, around uh, Canada and the U.S. and surveillance of Internet and cell phone activities of citizens. Um, that's one example of, of just going through reams and masses of, of data to try to make sense. Um, so in this uh, information and uh, digital economy, we spend much of our time sending and receiving information. In the larger context, you know, we ask ourselves, how can we and should we make sense of it all? Uh, I, I came across an interesting stat. Every day, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created. And yeah, that's, I think, there's 18, 10 with 18 zeros after. I could be wrong, but I think that's about right. Uh, so there's enormous uh, potential in sifting through all this, uh, shaping this disparate data into intelligent and uh, usable information. Uh, doing so will drive wealth creation and uh, help make better sense of our world. However, there are risks. Uh, if you think about the efforts to map the human genome and relating this to cause and effect of diseases, that's a, that's a great outcome. However, the corollary is once mapped, are we at risk of things like uh, biogenetic warfare, which is a pretty scary thought. I would argue that the inability uh, of many to effectively manage and understand data on an enterprise basis, let alone a macro basis, was one of the key contributing factors in the financial collapse. So how do we determine what's important, what's not, and what to do about it? This panel will talk about some of these questions and issues related to this big data question. The panel here has actually uh, been selected uh, based on their different uh, experiences and roles with companies. So uh, they have a different uh, view on technology and capital markets. So it should be a, an interesting conversation. Now we have some questions. Um, so we're going to be a little bit structured, but also free flow. So why don't we start, and I think all the uh, gentlemen on the panel here are interested in, in answering the, question, uh, the first question, which is, is there a com common definition of big data? and whether across the buy side, sell side, or vendors. So uh, I'll leave it to uh, Bill Ruva. Why don't you start? Uh, well, common, I think a common definition is a little bit of a stretch. I would say broadly there is a conceptual understanding at this point of big data. Um, big data is, um, it's in my own opinion, it is not an end in itself, but a means to an end, and it is there as a tool to help customers of ours and businesses all over achieve their business objectives more efficiently and effectively. Um, so the term big data gets used quite a lot in the media right now. Um, obviously, it's being used quite heavily around the discussion around NSA lately. Um, a lot of times it's used in a way that's fairly vague and not very defined about what the technology actually is and what it can do. Um, I see it used often in terms nowadays. It's being discussed almost as if they're just talking about data analysis in general. But from a technology perspective, uh, there's a core set of technologies. A lot of this originated with... Um, technology that companies like Google and Amazon developed for handling very large data sets and being able to scale out uh, very cost effectively with commodity hardware. So they've built these frameworks that you can 
build a cluster of nodes, uh, you can process data in parallel, and that lets you either handle large volumes of data or you can handle data, um, do computationally intensive tasks uh, much quicker. So that opens up a whole range of applications that you can do uh, that conventional technology is less suited to. Um, there's also technology around handling different types of data. So there's alternate data stores that can handle un what we call unstructured data. So that lets you begin to process other data sources from your enterprise, not just the, the data that's sitting in your transactional systems, but you can start pulling in data like uh, voice logs, uh, video uh, conversations. Um, you can start mining email conversations or, gra or grabbing information from system logs, and you can incorporate, incorporate that into the analytics solutions. So that's sort of from a technology perspective what we see it as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the internet, and Google's a great example of, of a technology that really shaped and changed the way uh, information was searched and, and retrieved, right? So interesting stuff, which uh, Hadoop uh, is a very good technology around that. So maybe Adam, you can Google, yeah, Google had published research papers explaining what they did in 2004, and actually that was the birth of Hadoop, which is a technology now synonymous with big data. Big data is a marketing term. Um, it's better to dismiss it in some cases than actually digest it and focus on your problems. I think big data falls into technology and a problem space. So we've talked a little bit about the technology. I happen to work um, on and with a company that focuses on open source Hadoop. Hadoop is one of those technologies that was born to index the entire internet. So we're talking petabytes and exabytes at scale. And uh, in terms of the technology, as mentioned, it's commodity, it's scale out. I think it's relevant to mention that it's open source and it's basically dem uh, democratizing the, the way we handle data and the way we manage data. And it's, it's sort of like the Napster for data management. So you're going to deal with uh, new ways of, of taking money in if you're a big IT company and you're not thinking about uh, Hadoop in your solution and your strategy. Uh, some companies are in the point where they're you know, in anger and denial, and some are in uh, bargaining and acceptance, and thankfully quite a few are in bargaining and acceptance, and they're, uh, they're in a strategic partnership with many of the open source Hadoop companies out there. The other side of it I mentioned was the problem space, and you know, at the most general term, uh, it, it, can, it can be anything from large analytics to something as simple as just landing and processing a large amount of data. I mean, government's actually one of the biggest users, and we mentioned this, of Hadoop on the planet, both Canadian and the U.S., especially the U.S. They realize the value proposition, and they're taking in data, and instead of pushing stuff to tape, which is where you store your long-term backups, they're exposing what used to be a backup as an analytical footprint. So now we have a reservoir. Um, we like to use the term data lake upon which we can actually build and draw an analytics base from. So we use existing BI tools. We have these problems that we were, uh, we were either not addressing before or we're now able to address over a large period of time. If you're discovering a drug, it's now let's, let's do research for the entire population. Uh, if you're doing something in capital markets, it's let's figure out the trading history and competitive trading history over two desks over you know, the month, the year, you know, your entire retention cycle. So there's a lot more access to store data cheaply that you would have dropped before. Uh, and the problem space is also an opportunity space. So I don't, I don't want to take up too much time from, uh, yeah. from Adam as well. So. All right, Adam. Adam uh, from Streambase. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think the first thing is, like, like we said before, there's no standardized definition. And we see our clients using it from traditional trading platforms like historical backtesting and large data sets to looking at their clients and the consumers and, and marrying this historical information with some real-time data for, let's say, real-time fraud detection. So I think this, this term big data is this umbrella term that means a lot of uh, different technologies. What we like to do when we go into clients is, is try to uh, get on the same foot with them. Um, and to do this, we, we, we define big data sort of at, at the data level. It's the three V's of big data. It's volume, variety, and velocity. So volume is, you know, it's big data. You're dealing with a lot of information. It's not 100,000 lines of Excel spreadsheet code. It's terabytes, you know, exabytes, petabytes of data that's flowing into your system. You got variety. And it's both, like, like the other panelists said, it's structured and unstructured. Structured is your traditional, let's say, market data sources, news sources. And you got unstructured data, 
log files, social media data. And the problem with that unstructured data is that it lacks context. So that's what the difficulty there, uh, there lies. And finally, especially because we're sort of a CDP vendor, this velocity is, is a big issue. It's consuming data in real time, uh, processing it, analyzing it, putting it into these sort of distributed file systems, and then making real time decisions with that data. So that means you have to marry huge amounts of historical context with real time information to make some kind of smart business decision in real time. So uh, from our point of view, we like to define it at a data level, three Vs of, of big data. <laughs> okay, thanks, Adam. And Chris. I, I think just to extend a bit on the points that, uh, that both of the Adams have made, um, th there is quite a bit of, of variability and ambiguity around how the term big data is being used. Um, some of our customers are using that to describe the challenges associated with the data volumes and the data structures and the data sources that we haven't conventionally been forced or given the opportunity to integrate. And in many cases, they're talking about the technologies and the solutions that allow them to, to do those things. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's not necessarily a new technology. Um, as Adam mentioned, it's been around for a while. It's a proven technology, but it's new in terms of mindshare and the amount of attention that it's getting at the executive level and even at the, the level of the, the architects within most of the organizations we deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so as an, as an integration solutions provider, um, we typically get involved with our customers who are trying to decide what value is this, this solution or this, uh, this set of technologies going to deliver to our organization. How do we leverage that alongside the other sources of information? Is this going to be our, our sole repository? Is this going to be another repository that sits alongside our ERPs and CRMs and data warehouses? And we're really at a state, I think, at this point where nobody knows. Um, it's, it's still up in the air, and, and it would be interesting to see what happens when the dust settles in terms of the, the relative priority and, uh, and focus of the platform. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in the industry, and we're all... Uh, we all have these questions around, okay, so we have a lot of data. We have a lot of different systems and databases and so forth. Um, so then the question is, you know, should we get into evaluating, you know, what we're calling a big data initiative, for lack of a better term? Um, so I guess there's probably questions, should you do something about big data? And, and then what should you do? So maybe we'll uh, sure. go to you, John. Um, so first, I like uh, Adam's point where he's talking about the idea of having a problem space and an opportunity space. So I think it's very early in the technology adoption cycle for many firms, especially in the financial services sector. And right now, we, we don't really see so much demand at the moment uh, as interest in. Uh, people are just trying to figure out what the technology is and how it fits in their enterprise. And if you read in the media, there's a lot of discussion about big data as if it's a problem, that we have too much data and we can't process it. And I think that's a useful view if you're a vendor trying to sell a product. But when I talk to customers, um, when they say that they have a big data problem, a lot of the time that's only partially true. Um, they do have problems with large data sets. A lot of these are more fundamental problems that they're having with data management issues and still relying on a lot of manual processes for exception handling. And that's, a lot of those issues can be addressed using conventional uh, business analytics technology. It doesn't necessarily need uh, imply that you need to go to this approach. Um, on the other hand, this technology does open up a lot of opportunities that maybe weren't available using the conventional technology. And I think that's where I see the interest line right now. People are trying to look at how they can use this to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, uh, how they can take advantage of some of their information assets that they haven't been able to fully utilize before. And I see today Brokers, are, especially in the broker-dealer community, uh, they do un underutilize their information, and not just this sort of unstructured data, but even the data that's sitting in their relational databases, they don't fully utilize it uh, to the extent that they can. And I think people are still trying to get to that stage before they really open it up and move to real-time analytics and so on. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so I noticed, Bill, when he said it was just a means for vendors to sell more product. I, I noticed you looked over pretty sharply there. So, so what's your view on, uh, on, on what uh, Sean had to say? No, I, um, I, I was just listening. I think I agree with everybody. I mean, I think, I think the whole concept of, the, of big data is, um, and I think some of the principles are, it needs to be accessible. It needs to be usable. It needs to be 
properly interpreted, so you're going to inject a bit of human judgment and, and um, intellect into that process. And then hopefully at the end of that, it's going to be correctly actioned. Um, so I, I, see it as, um, I see it as a problem for a lot of organizations. I see it as a solution. As a vendor, um, we see it very much like we see an investment in technology. We will follow the trends of our customers. We will partner with best of breed technology providers in the big data space. And we'll also incorporate the big data into our organic product offerings as, as, as appropriate according to our customer needs. Okay, so um, I mean, we're in a knowledge based economy, right? Information is really important. Uh, can provide a lot of differentiation in terms of wealth creation and competitiveness on a global stage. Um, so how do we, uh, as Canadians and so forth, and you know, capital markets experts, uh, kind of lead in, in this regard? And uh, what, what do you think we can do? That's one of the questions that's not on the list here, but just if you, you have any thoughts around that. Adam. I, I guess it's if you have a well-defined business problem that, that requires this space, then you can take the lead by you know, looking at third-party vendors, by investing the time and effort into, into learning these systems, because there is a technology gap there and, and maybe an education gap. But I think, um, you know, in a few years we're going to be saying uh, data. It's not going to be big data. And, and that's because this is at least the technology space and the analytics built upon this technology. It, it's really at its infancy. And so you, if you have a well-defined problem, you can take the lead. But in a few years, there are going to be a lot more technology solutions and, and a lot more complex analytics to support this so that maybe the barrier to entry into the space won't be as, as, as high. So if, if it's of interest, um, the actual problems that we find work, and incidentally, I've, uh, as one of the developers and the vendors of Hadoop, we have implemented quite a few solutions, especially in the States when it comes to financial uh, financial services in general as well as the markets. It usually uh, comes from the push to rationalize architecture or reduce cost initially. In other words, shorten ETL life cycles. That would be transformation of the data pathway that ends up eventually doing your analytics. Uh, They typically look to create new data products and new ways of doing business and as in something they can sell down the road. But actually just rationalizing all the data in one location as a landing zone for data is the first step that most of these organizations take. And the choice is, if, is, is usually governed by can they save money initially and then can they make money off of it after. And it's not always a fit, as pointed out. You know, there's a, there's a gap uh, in, in skills and knowledge and you don't necessarily want to have to pay $200,000 for a Hadoop engineer when we know that a year from now it'll be a lot less if not half of that. So there is... There's a value assessment that needs to be made, and there's a, a skills and a, a training gap right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris, I know we talked about uh, that issue where you know you're faced with all these legacy databases and reports and so forth. Um, Composite seems to provide an interesting way to sort of bring it up and, and sort of a, a, abstract it in some form to make it more usable and accessible. Um, maybe you can touch on. An yeah, it's of that in it, capital certainly within the, the capacity of the big data discussion. It's an interesting <laughs> argument because one of the one of the fundamental value drivers of the big data platform, as Adam mentioned, is this capability to rationalize disparate architecture that exists in most large organizations right now, and the cost and the challenges of integrating data that reside in multiple different platforms um, is tremendous. Um, so there's a couple different a couple different ways that that challenge can be addressed. Whether there's rationalization and consolidation at a physical architecture level or whether there's an introduction of an abstraction layer, which is is traditionally where Composite sits, and providing a service-based interface to all of those different repositories of data, allowing for the consumption and the querying and the utilization of that data according to whatever rules are in place at the the business layer. So I think there's a a complementary fit there, um, both at the integration layer as well as at the rationalization of the physical layer, uh, and that in deciding where and how a big data solution may be relevant. Maybe that's in reducing the cost associated with the physical architecture. Maybe that's in attempting to leverage value in data sources uh, that don't currently fit into the physical infrastructure that's in place. Uh, So in either of those scenarios, uh, we're still looking in the short term at architecture that will contain a number of different repositories or or vertical placements of data. Uh, So the challenge will remain, to some extent, how do we get an integrated view 
of data that resides in these different sources that's typically accessed through different means. Um, and that's a challenge that, uh, that I think we'll see remain. Um, the big data play may, uh, may help address that in the short term and uh, it'd be interesting to see as the, uh, as the state of the technology matures to what extent that, uh, that encompasses other traditional sources. Okay, thanks. Um, another thing maybe we can talk about is um, social media, sentiment data. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot going on in the world in terms of po uh, politics and a lot of changes going on. Um, you know, you can call it citizen, uh, citizenship journalism, I guess. Everyone has a right to, uh, to voice their opinion. And, you know, in terms of Twitter and everything that's going on out there in the world, how, do you, uh, how would you suggest we, we deal with that massive amount of, inf of information and try to make sense of it? Um, so this idea of sentiment analysis, drawing in social media feeds and using it to um, look for signals. So in the financial services space, there's probably two, two major use cases for this is being able to drive trading strategies from it. Uh, the other way it's used is basically um, from a sales and marketing perspective, uh, looking at how your customers are responding to your offering. So for a bank, for instance, they can uh, gauge the level of sentiment based on your product offering. So it has two uses in that. Um, I think in the first case where you're looking at trading strategies, it raises an interesting issue about uh, some of the business challenges around using data in this, in this way. Um, you need to have proper risk controls around that. And a good example that was seen just last uh, April was an example of the Twitter feed being hijacked, uh, the AP Twitter feed, and that generating uh, signals in the market. So you're faced with this problem of uh, you're drawing in this data and trying to use it for trading, but how reliable is that data and is it susceptible to manipulation? Uh, we live in an era now where literally people can use bots to generate what looks like a legitimate signal, and how do you distinguish between a real signal and a false signal? So uh, there's, there's business risk around it that we as an industry need to uh, address. I don't think, as Adam points out, that the knowledge base isn't necessarily there yet. Uh, we don't really have a good sense in the industry of how to control some of these data. So. I would say you have to be fairly cautious in how you adopt it initially. And there's a, there's a governance question about yeah. this, too, um, that doesn't change whether or not using a big data technology is how trustworthy is that data? Do you want to make decisions off of it? These are problems that are not solved by technology. Um, they can be helped, but uh, at the end of the day, if, if you can get additional information and blend it into an existing data set, it will be valuable. What I see financial services doing right now with actual big data technologies when they do bring in the social media is that it enhances a view that they already had or negates it and calls it into question. It's not a reliable enough source right now uh, and not quantifiable enough to actually make a lot of decisions on it. Actually, a lot of the big data, um, or at least let's be specific, the Hadoop solutions tend to be on what we call structured data, in other words, operational data that already existed in the organization itself or was from other business-to-business -business, um, options, uh, other business-to-business -business data sources. So it's, social media is actually less important, not in the long run, but in the immediate adoption, I think, of a lot of big data technologies. Until there's some governance around it? Until there's some knowledge on how to do the governance as a business process and a risk assessment. It, again, the technology is there to analyze it. NLP is around. We've had it for a long period of time. But qualifying whether or not it's useful is something that I don't think anyone's that good at yet. I have a few colleagues actually in Toronto working on a product around that. But it's still early. So. It's, a, it's actually interesting. I attended a conference just last week on big data and its, and its relation to social media. And you know, NLP, uh, sorry, natural language processing, sentiment analysis, you know, that's all well and good, but the majority of, of players there were just using simple counting metrics. So how many times did a customer click on this link or visit this site? Can I associate that with a geographic location? So it is still very, in, in, even in terms of the analysis uh, that is being done, it's still very early on. It's a, it's a nascent technology and nascent space. So saying, you know, that this is really uh, a big thing right now and, and very trustworthy, uh, I don't think we can say that now. They're even working on their own uh, problems that, that sort of they get right. So. 
So just a question to the audience. How many uh, people in the audience have a, uh, a tablet of some kind? So about half, maybe a bit more. Um, it's interesting when I, when I was looking at sort of the evolution of the digital uh, economy. It was the 80s when the PC came out, um, the 1990s when uh, World Wide Web uh, came to fruition, and it was only two, you know, the 2000s when cell phones came out. And uh, I remember having my first cell phone, and it was this huge device, and I was made fun of after six months. But, um, and then it's only been the 2010s where um, you know, mobile tablets and social media and networking have, have really taken hold. So it hasn't been that long. It's been you know, you know, three, four years, right? So we're dealing with uh, this burgeoning technology and trying to make sense of it all. And it's happening really quickly, so you know, exponentially. Um, I read in a white paper somewhere that um, you know, uh, resolving the big data issue and making sense of it uh, will be more important than the uh, the creation of the internet. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it, you know, certainly there's, there's a lot going on out there. It's it's an interesting note, just very quickly on the notion of cell phones, because at the end of the day, if anyone's going to compress history and take a look back. I imagine cell phones will be, big data will be aside. Uh, a, a lot of aspects of the internet, if you were to look back over 100 years, would be irrelevant compared to cell phone technology because it's when we actually started carrying personal computers. It generates more data. It creates a machine network, and it generates and, and fosters social data. So while we're still trying to figure out social data, the next generation is MQTT, or machine technology talking to each other. And that is the next big data problem that we're going to face. To a certain degree, we, especially with cell phones, 600 terabytes a day in some cases, we deal with uh, a lot of large ingest problems around just being able to track cell phones and understand them and make them work. Cell phones are the progenitors for the next generation of computing, and this is the next big data problem. So we better get this stuff fixed right now and move on forward with that, because this is a problem that's actually accelerating is machine technology talking to machines. So. It's amazing to think about, um, again, this national security issue and uh, you know, looking at correlations of, of activities between you know, individuals. And then you can go, once you've identified uh, certain behaviors, you can go back in history and, and really get into it. So it's out there. Once it's out there, it's in the ether. Uh, you, know, you can't get it back, right? So. Uh, you know, the, the whole Big Brother thing is, is uh, an interesting uh, thought around that. So, um, so uh, you know, when we're talking about the firms here, and those of you who are interested, sorry to have my back this way, it's just the panels on this side. Um, how should firms go about uh, creating a big data strategy? Or, you know, as we all integrate and merge and move stuff around, um, how do you make sense and use of that? And, and how can some of the folks here maybe take a stab at... Uh, you know, uh, entering into some kind of you know business model or strategy around big data. Sure, I'll take a first stab at that. I think um, you know, as is the case with all new, inherently different or, or fundamentally different technologies, um, the first challenge is going to be let's not bring in the technology because it's new and interesting. It's about determining what challenge will this help us address that we're currently facing. Or what opportunity are we not leveraging that this will allow us to, uh, to take advantage of? Um, and in deciding that, obviously, that needs to be weighed against the, the status quo or the baseline of how would we do those things with our current technology. So it's great to say that we're going to be able to leverage new types of data, bring in sentiment analysis and social media data. Uh, but if the anticipated value of that at this stage doesn't warrant challenges associated with bringing in a fundamentally new architecture, uh, a, a new means of, of architects designing and integrating solutions, um, then the answer might be now is not the right time. So I think those are the, it's, it's, it's a self-evident answer to some extent, I think, but they're fundamental considerations that often get overlooked when there's so much analysis, so much media coverage, so much analyst coverage about the technology that, that we see a lot of customers who are saying, we need this. You know, how can you help us bring this in? And in, in trying to answer the question of, well, why do you feel you need it and what are you going to do with it? The answer is more often than not, we'll figure that out when we get it. And, and that's a pretty expensive way of, of learning about yeah. new technologies. So. Sounds familiar. Um, we'll build it and something will happen. An epiphany. So if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Bill and, and Thomson Reuters, so they've, they've you know, launched a hosted uh, solution and uh, I think some of that's around, you know, how, how do you uh, 
how can you service the industry through, you know, software as a service model, a hosting model, save costs, and so forth. So maybe you can touch on that, and then maybe we can get into some of the, the cloud computing security issues and things like that. Yeah, well, I, I, I definitely agree with what was just said in terms of what are we trying to solve through big data. And as I said earlier, I don't see it as an end in itself. I see it as a means to an end. What is your business objective? Um, you know, as it, it relates very differently to capital markets than it does to a consumer products organization. Um, but back to, back to managed services and, and hosted solutions, um, as I said earlier as well, I think accessibility is a key point here. And at some point, you know, whether there's a, whether there's a definition that states big data is purely unstructured or is a combination of structured and unstructured data, there's at some point going to need to be some normalization layer of that big data in order to make it available. And that big, it needs to be organized, it needs to be normalized, and then, quite frankly, um, down the road, I think it would, be, it would need to be offered as a service so that customers are not having to execute individual big data strategies. Um, we work with our customers and our partners very closely as they evolve their business models to an as-a-service or a cloud-based business model. And I can see that direction um, taking hold in the not-so-distant future with respect to big data. I don't think customers are each going to want to execute on individual strategies. They're going to want to tap into the data they need for the particular objective they're looking to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, we had a pre-call on Friday, and we are talking about, you know, the cost to do a lot of this. And, you know, some of the larger firms uh, might have more resources. However, uh, there are creative solutions out there, and I guess you're, you're being one of them. And, um, but there's also cloud computing and things uh, to leverage out there. And so uh, who wants to touch on that? Uh, we're working on something right now to uh, rationalize the deep dis uh, deployment as well as add that layer into it. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of it in this, in this group, but obviously everyone's heard of cloud computing. OpenStack is an open source version, if you will, of the Amazon Web Services that have been extremely successful. Uh, the OpenStack is, other than Hadoop, probably one of the most important and busiest open source projects right now. Certainly both of these garner a lot of the talent in the industry. The OpenStack project that we're working on, we being Hortonworks with the community, is called Savannah. So we're trying to create Hadoop as a service. In other words, big data as a service. You will find engineering platforms from um, Microsoft. We work with them as well, actually. They're doing uh, launching Azure. They're launching HD Insight within Azure. Again, it's a cloud platform with a uh, Hadoop engine in between. So people are building it out, and there's large companies getting over their you know, bargaining and acceptance phase and actually developing this. So that's one aspect of it. I will go back to a question that we hit to, um, not to derail us too much, but on the notion of uh, whether or not we go out and we try it right away or whether we sit down and we plan this out, Hadoop is one of the few technologies, again, speaking of Hadoop, where it is a, I have seen build it and, and they will come use case scenarios. So it is a situation where if you're willing to make a minor investment, these teams tend to be five people, they tend to be smart. Again, if you want to find out if someone's smart in your team, put something new in front of them. So when, what's happened is we've had, taken small teams, they've taken large data sets, and they've started to do exploration. So, and go ahead. Uh, um, it's, it's interesting you bring this up because I've, I've been at clients who, who have done that and then are using Hadoop just as, as a new database. So just throwing in a ton of data and not really using you know, all the, the capabilities that you, you, could, you could use in, in a big data system. And you know, especially as my role, you know, I'm a quantitative consultant, I think understanding the analytics and having a, a plan on what metrics you want to calculate and how you're going to do that is really something you should be thinking of before you implement or look at the technology. And, and because this is hard. Uh, the people who are doing this uh, in the marketing space uh, find this difficult. The people in the computer science industry find this difficult to create reliable metrics on structured and unstructured data and then combine it from streaming sources, historical data, into some semblance of information that can be acted upon or, or consumed by people. Um, so it's, it's very difficult and I think have, having some kind of plan before you get into this technology it is a very prudent business decision. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, so you need to hire smart people, obviously. Um, but people need to think about uh, data and, and need, your organization needs to build those competencies in on a go forward basis. I mean, we all need to look at it. It's not going to happen outside of, of just putting systems in place. 
you actually have to understand uh, the information and what it means and how it correlates or how to add value and so forth, right? So, um, um, I just want to talk to it from a financial perspective. Having uh, built applications in banking environments before, I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of overhead in bringing new technology into a bank, and that doesn't matter whether it's commercial or open source technology. And as both Adam had pointed out, uh, this technology is relatively new. It requires new skill sets. I can tell you from a technology perspective, this isn't just like choosing another vendor system. It's like a whole different design paradigm. So uh, even though you can work with small teams and try and learn the technology, the first time out, it's going to be very difficult. And it's not just building the application. It's getting them up to the point where their production-grade uh, software they can support in a banking environment. And that requires a lot of overhead. There's more than just the development teams that have to be involved. It's the enterprise architects, the security engineers, the network engineers, the DBAs. They all know, have to know how to support it. From a risk management point of view, they have to know how to properly govern it. So you have to allow for all that the first time you bring it in. So I would be very cautious in terms of the first time out, uh, stay away from things that are like customer facing or mission critical applications. I would pick something that's, uh, you want something that's interesting and complex enough that will push the team to really learn how to use the technology, but uh, nothing business critical. And then in terms of leveraging cloud services, I think here in Canada, the problem is, is that a lot of the cloud offerings are based in the US. So for most financial firms, they have a real concern with putting their data into even if it's a private cloud, the fact that it's being hosted outside of a Canada is a big issue. Uh, the cloud offerings, even pri private cloud offerings, are not really here in Canada. So I think you can look at that as a strategy in terms of reducing your overall support costs, but I don't know if it'll get you to market faster because you'll probably still have to build out that private cloud solution here in Canada. So. Okay. So there are, there are some challenges, obviously. Incidentally, um, cloud is not a precursor requirement to big data technology. It's just something that makes a lot of this more consumable. Mm -hmm. And another thing is Amazon just finally released a uh, Canadian cloud-only service, so it, it will grow up and come mm -hmm. to us eventually. Okay. So, so thematically, I'm hearing you know, pick, pick some spots, do a proof of concept, understand operationally how these things can work, need to work, from the different layers of, of you know, data management, security, governance, and all that. Uh, so those are key factors. The one point I'd say is a proof of concept probably isn't good enough. You really have to get it to production. Right. Uh, there's a big difference between getting something running in a development environment and getting it into a production environment and being able to support it for six months. So I think that's your minimum that you want to aim for, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Just one other comment as well on that is I think, you know, it's an interesting, we've talked a lot about understanding where it's going to fit and what value it's going to deliver, uh, particularly by the time something gets to production, it's probably not going to be something that delivers value in isolation of all of your other internal architecture and internal systems. So there's the consideration as well of once we get this thing built and it's actually giving us what we need, how do we fit that together with the other components? So, so maybe we can um, sort of frame it then in terms of, uh, again, how do, you, how do you approach solving the problem? Is it, um, you know, uh, it's a business need, it's a business problem uh, that requires inputs and technology and so forth. You know, how, how can we help the folks here maybe take a stab at, uh, you know, an initiative, a use case? Um, what would be sort of some next steps in, in helping uh, people kind of attack this? Um, sorry to do this again, but uh, you know what we like to subscribe to in our company is like the four A's. Uh, you know, we have all these acronyms, I guess. Um, so as easy I, to remember, probably. Right? Yeah, it's, it's easy to remember. And um, so the first thing is obviously the business decision. But after that, after you've sort of said, you know what, I think this might be something that we investigate. Do the analysis. That's the first day. Make sure that you know what analytics uh, are going to be useful to drive whatever program you're, you're, you're looking at, and make sure that they are actually feasible. Because some people have decided, oh, I'm going to do this, and then realized after the fact that it's not so easy to do. Um, so after you, after the analysis accumulate, that's when you invest into the te technologies and start accumulating the data from the different structured and unstructured data sources. Finally, um, when you're building the system, there's also this concept of access. 
you know, at some point people are going to have to use this data and make decisions on it. So make sure you're, you're providing visualization tools or some sort of tool so that uh, the people who are consuming it can uh, just, you can distill the data into consumable bytes so people can actually do something with it. And, and finally, because you're dealing with a lot of data, because of its pace and, and sort of the, the spare uh, data sources, automation is key. That's the last day. It's about doing things, uh, making business decisions that are automated off uh, a combination of real-time and historical data sources coming together. So that's what we sort of abide by. Uh, Chris, do you want to? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's certainly uh, an interesting challenge and the one that really resonates. Obviously, you know, I, with composite, we have a, a slightly different, maybe a little bit higher focus within the challenges of of information access and information management. Um, and, and the one key point that, um, that I had to mention that, that seemed to really resonate was the concept of, of making the output of this system consumable. Um, it, it really is, as has been mentioned a few times, this is a different design paradigm. Uh, a lot of the architecture is fundamentally different from, from what your engineers and your architects are used to dealing with right now. Uh, and even once that challenge is addressed and, and they learn how to use that technology, um, there's the question of, well, what about all of our applications? What about our BI tools and our portals and dashboards that right now expect to see something that looks like a standard relational database? And we're seeing evolution in, in the big data space, to use that analogous term, uh, technologies like Hive and Impala uh, that are starting to, to build that type of, of presentation layer sitting on top of the architecture and fundamentally abstracting away the complexity or the technical details of that level of the uh, the space. So I think we're going to see a convergence. We start to see application layer tools that are building in support for direct native connectivity. We're starting to see the solution providers create their own abstraction layers that are exposing that platform through some of the more conventional standard protocols. Uh, and then certainly there's technologies that, that, that bridge that gap. Um, so it's a, it's a fundamental issue of, you know, as we sort of mature and move through that decision and that discussion around, should we be investigating where is it going to fit? What value is it going to deliver? And how are we, how are we going to realize that in terms of, of getting that data in a, in a consumably usable format? Okay, very good. Um, and, and Bill? No, I would completely agree with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's access, it's usability, and it's, um, it, it's a fit-for-purpose solution to get to your objective. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, Sean. Um, traditionally speaking, and I may have done maybe more of the Hadoop implementations and anybody in this room. So I'll speak with some experience and authority here. One, Canadians are a little bit behind the curve on this. Two, POCs are totally fine. I'm sorry to disagree. Um, the trick is, though, and it's a relevant point, Sean, that, uh, is that POCs are better suited to data that is production worthy. In other words, you have to plan some degree of what questions are we going to ask. So start with big questions like, what's my exposure to Greece? End up with more specific questions about something that's going to define your data sets. Choose your data sets. You'll end up with um, a, a pile of data that needs to be analyzed. And if the technology is low cost enough, and if it's not aiming to be in production, then there is plenty of value to be had in doing a POC to the side of your primary data pipeline and be able to actually extract value and determine what value you'll be able to extract down the road, or sorry, sorry to extract down the road. So the the problem is um, everyone thinks that they're going to load this in and they're going to replace their existing services. They're going to use Hive or use the impals of the world to actually start plugging their BI tools into it. And in fact, most successful implementations start out with a crack team that's deciding to do fraud detection and take the data off, go off to the side and do something useful with it and then slowly integrate this back into their existing processes. Their BI tools are never interrupted because they continue to go against the enterprise data warehouse, as they always did. The enterprise data warehouse is fed with the additional data and the processed and analyzed data from something like Hadoop. So it's a parallel part of the chain that eventually evolves to become part of the primary data pipeline and fully expect to have Hadoop in your data center going forward. It's a good plug. Um, Sean. Um, I mean, in terms of some actual business cases uh, on the financial services side, um, we talked about the one about using uh, uh, 
public data feeds to drive trading strategies. Um, there's also areas like uh, risk. So we, we brought up the point of uh, mining through your data, looking for patterns in that data, uh, either for criminal behavior or fraud. Um, it's also useful in a corporate governance aspect, uh, making sure that processes are being followed as, as described. So that, I think that's important in the current regulatory climate where we're at right now, where it's very important that we um, both document these processes and we monitor them and make sure that they're being followed. So I see it having good applications in that area. Um, another area that I see quite uh, useful is in areas, especially at the enterprise level, where you have to do uh, risk analytics, fairly maybe complex analytics against multiple asset classes. So you've gone to where you have all these silo systems that may be able to do it on an individual portfolio basis, but then you need a sort of more generic framework that can handle it across all those asset classes, and that's one of the applications where I could see it being quite useful. Mm -hmm. So I think the other one for banking, um, I think we touched on this before, is understanding the customer engagement, because the customers are coming in through so many different channels in the banks today. Uh, Getting a holistic view of what they're doing uh, through all your channels is quite challenging right now. And this type of technology can help with that sort of application, I think. Okay. So cross-asset, cross-channels, client information. Interesting to see what you're looking at fraud, you're looking at risk, so you can take take that because those are efforts that are tangible and in, in working with disparate data and then maybe leveraging that. Um, so maybe we'll just uh, we'll close off with maybe a comment from Adam and then we can open it up to questions. Oh, um, if, no, if, I, if you're prepared for that. Uh, I think, uh, no, I'm, I'm okay. Are you good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, anybody else have any uh, closing remarks before we open it up? I just I back to um, something that Adam mentioned before the three V's. It was variety. That was you. I'm sorry. It, it was variety, <laughs> volume, velocity, variety and velocity, and volume, right? Um, and I, as as I was thinking about this, velocity, I think, would become more and more important to the capital markets segment. I mean, anything that's market moving, latency is going to follow, right? So, I mean, this becomes more and more um, the velocity. Mm-hmm. piece of it becomes more and more germane and applicable to capital markets in particular. To be fair, a lot of it's intraday, at least from a Hadoop perspective right now, rather than um, anything that would be co-located with front-end systems. So so we are talking about an analytics, less about CEP. That's where mm-hmm. Adam comes well, in. I guess I, I can speak to something now. Uh, you know, a lot of the clients that we deal with are using this as customer engagement tools. You know, it's They build a huge repository of, of information using, let's say, Hadoop and then are, are combining sort of very uh, detailed analytics of, of that particular customer with real-time information that is coming in from, you know, uh, Internet or, or, or even phones or talking to call, you know, call people in the call center, and then, you know, maybe offering a customized solution to that, to, for this particular individual. So this marriage of real-time and, you know, a lot of analytics or a lot of information historical information is at least from stream basis perspective since we're a CP vendor where we, f- we see big data going. Okay, great. So uh, why don't I open up uh, for questions. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Okay. Just to, re- just to repeat myself, it, with the concept of big data comes the concept of big ownership. Uh, you now start having, like the Genome Project, where you have um, uh, companies who patent gene sequences and so forth uh, based on the genome, and you've had some precedent for that. I could see the same sort of thing happening within a big data environment where you're collecting something that's, potent- that's uh, notionally in the public domain, but the next thing you know, you've got a pattern or a sequence that is, quote unquote, owned by somebody else. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the gentlemen there uh, went back to talk about, talk about governance. And I think that governance um, cannot exclude this as a priority uh, when you're starting to talk about lots of people collecting lots of large amounts of data because you're going to clearly have overlap. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I've seen this, but OK. So in, in government and actually um, in biotech, uh, there's a lot of research that's going to be uh, need to be excluded from other bodies of knowledge. Certain people have access to it. It's it's a governance problem. 
especially when it comes to the, the patents. There's way too many patents in the biotech industry already, but uh, tracking all that is, is a technology problem. It's a governance problem. Having it all in the same pile is convenient, but uh, the same problem occurs with health and human services in the government as well, because there's a bunch of really good laws that prevent the government from analyzing one data set and comparing it to another data set, thankfully for our privacy's sake. And there probably need to be a lot more very good laws, especially in Canada, in case anyone here is uh, writing to their MPP and MP. Um, the <laughs> So th there is a concern, um, but again, it, it's not the technology problem, it's a policy problem. Executing that policy is the same as executing at, um, Saks, Burns, and Oxley. It's just a matter of getting the, the auditing right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for uh, listening, and thank you again, the panelists. Uh, really appreciate your time and effort and thoughtfulness. Um, they'll be available uh, throughout lunch, and I think uh, uh, hopefully you'll stick around for the conference. Thank you.